If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 35. In your Korean Bibles, it's on page 1007. Francesca, I wish we had a Bible in German. We don't. <laughs> in your English Bibles, it's page 749 if you have a pew Bible. And Andrew, you can, yep, here you go. I should also give a thanks to um, Dr. Rudman, to Jerry and Dottie. Dottie drove the bus this morning, which was a challenge. Um, but uh, Dottie picked up uh, eight girls in the dorm, and Dr. Rudman got five boys. So thank, thank you to both of you. Um, if any of you ever want to help with this bus ministry, just talk to Dr. Rudman, to Dottie, or myself. We sometimes need drivers. We always aren't available every single Sunday. So thank you, Jerry and Dottie. Isaiah chapter 35. Hear then the word of God. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it and the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knee that gives way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs in the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of the holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will return unto Zion with singing. And everlasting joy will be upon their head. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you are not an unknown God. But you have revealed yourself to us. You've revealed yourself to us in the person of Jesus and in your written word. And so as we come to your written word, we pray that you would give us understanding. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you are familiar with the British author C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis um, lived in the 20th century. Um, he wrote a number of books, some theological works, such as Mere Christianity, but he also wrote a seven series thing called The Tales of Narnia, an allegory. And it was written for children. And the one that most of you may be familiar with is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I love it. I've watched the movie a thousand times. Uh, I've read the book a few times. It's just one of those beautiful, beautiful um, pictures of who God is. But C.S. Lewis was also an author and, and spoke oftentimes in Great Britain. And at one of his times when he was lecturing, he said, God is more willing to meet us than we are to meet God. God is more willing to meet us than we are to meet God. And that's the story of the Bible. I leave this up here for a purpose. This is the Bible. And this is the history of God working for our redemption. It has these red threads run it through it because every book in the Bible talks about Jesus. 
Every book looks forward to Jesus coming. And we've been in the book of Isaiah before, but we're in the book of Isaiah again this morning. And so we call all of this history that's in the Bible redemptive history because it's the story that God wants to know you. And it's the story of us not wanting to know God. It's a story of us running from God and rebelling against God. And it's a story that God continues to pursue us. Even when we want nothing to do with him, God loves us so much that he pursues us. And so it's not surprising when you come to the book of Isaiah, a book that was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus, that Isaiah the prophet in chapter 1 through chapter 34 shows us who God is. And not only does he show us who God is, he tells us who we are. And with a great deal of clarity, he speaks rather bluntly about who we are. Listen to these words in verse 9 of chapter 30. And he's not talking about the pagans who lived in Assyria or Egypt. He's talking about God's people. He's talking about people who went to church every, every Sabbath. He says, for these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instructions. And so the Bible makes it very clear in all of its pages that we don't by nature want to know God that's not our nature, to want to know God, much less trust him. We sort of like, we like being the captain of our own ship. We like making decisions for ourselves. We like to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We like to figure it out on our own. We like to depend on things around us when we're in need. We can act religious, much like the Jews in the Old Testament did. We act religious. We come to churches. We sit in pews. But so often, even though we sit in pews and we come to churches, we ultimately place our trust in other things. And so Isaiah writes in the very first chapter, again, he's speaking to the people of Israel. He says to the people of God, stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and convocations and holy days, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Here's God talking to the people of God, and he says, I'm tired of all your religious behavior. It's meaningless. Because you act religious, but your heart is far from me. And what has Isaiah told us about God? Isaiah tells us that God is our most loyal ally. That God is with us in the midst of our struggle. And he promises to forgive us. He promises to protect us. What did we learn? Isaiah 41. Fear not, God says. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not discouraged. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God, throughout the scripture, says, I want to know you. I want to help you. I want to strengthen you. And he wants to forgive us. So in chapter 1, Isaiah says to the people after telling them, don't come to church anymore. <laughs> I'm tired of your worthless holidays. Then God says to them, come now. Let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is faithful to us even when we are unfaithful to God, and he wants to forgive us our sins. But we are guarded, sometimes even rebellious, because we like to be in charge of our own lives. 
So in chapter 34, in chapter 35, God is saying to us, you're at a point in your life where you need to make up your mind. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to trust? And that question is put to us each and every day. Who are you going to trust? So often we have what I've called substitute saviors. We put our trust in things that we think we're going to make us happy. And we buy a new car. We buy a new house. We increase the money that's in our 401k. We, we get a, a college degree or we get specialized training. We get a promotion at work and we get a new skill and we add that to our portfolio. And we add all these things. We, we talk about our children. We talk about our grandchildren. We take pride in them and we should. But we think all of those things are going to ultimately give us purpose and meaning in life. We trust in friends. We take pleasures in this world to sometimes ease the pain. And Isaiah is urging us. Well, God has created many good things in the creation and many good things that we are to enjoy. He's saying, if you really want to find meaning and purpose, if you really want to understand what life is about, you need to trust me. I need to be your God. I need to be your Lord, your King. You need to get to know me. And so chapter 34 shows us what becomes of those who don't trust in him. You can read it on your own, but Jesus summarizes it in Matthew chapter 25. 34 is about the destruction that's going to come on people who choose not to trust God. Jesus says in Matthew 20, all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep, and he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. I never knew you. So Isaiah and all of Scripture is saying, you need to make up your mind because there is coming a judgment day where you're going to stand before God and you're going to say to God, I trusted you. You were my God. God has no, Ezekiel tells us that God has no desire to punish Ezekiel 33, verse 11 says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way, turn back. Why will you die, O Israel? God's saying, what's the purpose of dying just to pursue your pleasures? God begs them to turn back to him. And so when you come to the beginning of chapter 34, you read, draw near, O nations, to hear Give attention, people. God's saying, please, come near to me. Listen to me. Hear me. I want to know you. And the good news is that while we don't want to know God and want to trust him, God wants to know us. The scriptures tells us that we're the enemies of God, but God loves us, and he wants to redeem us. He wants to make us new. Chapter 35 of Isaiah is the story of God's redemption. God is in love with you. God was the one who created you. He made you in his image to know you so that you could have a relationship with him. And so that in a relationship with him, we could live out our lives on earth and do things that brought honor and glory to him. But the scripture says we've rebelled against God. We don't want to know God. We've sinned. And so God in the book of Isaiah is calling Israel back to himself. But Israel didn't want to trust God. And the interesting thing is, even though Israel didn't want to trust God, God never gave up on Israel. And God will never give up 
on you. And when we really trust God, when we really trust God, when we give God our lives, when we fall in love with Jesus, lo and behold, we find the Lord is there. When God is all we have, we discover God is all I need. When you're at the lowest point in your life and all you have is God, all your friends have deserted you, you're in a hospital bed, you're in a nursing home, you're in a car accident, and all you have is God, you discover God is there. When we're defeated, downcast, disgraced, broken, that's when God enters into our life. When we think we're the champions of our life, we're the captains of our ship, and we control everything, God may be a thought in our life, but God is not in the center of our lives. And so God wakes us up. Our hearts and our minds are made new. And we fall in love with Jesus. I went to church all of my life. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, went to church all of my life. Every morning I went to church. My mother and I, 5.30 in the morning, would go to church and serve mass for the nuns in the convent every morning, 5.30 a.m. But it wasn't until my sophomore year in college that I realized all of that was religious behavior, but I didn't know God. I was acting religiously, but I didn't know God. And so in the sophomore year when I was in college in 1969, my roommate shared with me how to know God by just simply telling him you love him, asking him to come into your life. When Jesus becomes beautiful for us, we fall in love with him. And it doesn't matter anymore what the world does to us. We are safe knowing that God loves us. It's God's grace that takes us to that place where, like Judah, we cry out to the Lord. Isaiah says in verse 17 of chapter 33, your eyes will behold the king in his beauty, and you will see a land that stretches afar. And so when you come to chapter 35, he begins, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice. It will blossom abundantly. And the glory of Lebanon will be given. And they shall see the glory of the Lord. God's talking about making things new. And he begins with us. He wants to make you new. That's why, that's why Paul in 2 Corinthians says, if anyone is joined to Jesus, to Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. When you trust God, the spirit of Christ comes to dwell within you and God makes you a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come because you're no longer trusting in yourselves, you're trusting in God. And God becomes your Lord, he becomes your king. What do we contribute to all of this? We contribute nothing. There's no religious behavior that you can offer to God. You can come to church like I did seven days a week. That doesn't get you into heaven. You can do works of mercy and you can feed the poor and clothe the naked and that's good and that's important, but that in and of itself won't get you to heaven. So we come to God blind and dumb and deaf and God gives us eyes to see, opens up our ears so that we understand the word of God when we read it. You know, I find it very interesting. When you go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the story of Jesus, one of the interesting things 
about the gospel, particularly in the gospel of Matthew, is that you read that Jesus was in Galilee or Jesus with his, was in Nazareth or Jesus was in Judea and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he was healing the blind, the lame, and the lepers. And you wonder, is that just a coincidence that Matthew keeps referring to Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom and, in the same sentence, and he was healing the blind, causing the lame to walk, raising the dead? I don't think it's a coincidence. I think the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were helping us to understand what Isaiah is saying. When God begins to redeem, he begins with us. But God's desire is to make all things new. That's why you read in Romans chapter 8, the creation groans awaiting for its redemption. The gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus is king. He's the Lord of all, all things. And to demonstrate that he was the king and that the kingdom of heaven, as we pray in the earth, Father, is coming to earth, he demonstrated he was the king. And so he healed the blind. He healed the lame that could not walk. And he raised the dead. As demonstration, kingdom has come. I'm beginning a new thing. And the new thing begins with you and I. Verse 8 and 9 of Isaiah, he says, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass. And it shall belong to those who walk on the way, even if they are fools. The lion shall be there, nor shall any, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. God makes a way that even those who are foolish, that would be me, even the foolish can find their way. Even when we are foolish and we continue to rebel against God, even when we're foolish and we continue to sin, even though we don't repent, Jesus keeps pursuing us. He keeps coming after us. He keeps drawing us to himself. And what is the highway that Isaiah is talking about? The highway is Jesus. What does Jesus say in John chapter 14? These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man, no man can come to the Father but by me. Those are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, the only way to know God, the only way to be redeemed is through me, trusting in what I do on the cross. And so when God redeems you, you fall in love with Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus in 1969. And when you fall in love with Jesus, you begin to catch a glimpse of what John Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress calls Emmanuel's land. You begin to catch a vision of what God has done. God created the universe and you and I in his image so that all of creation would give him glory. And when we sinned and we rebelled and the creation did not look like it was giving glory, did God just say, I'm done. I better come up with a plan B because plan A didn't work. No, God says, I will redeem man. I will change his heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And man will learn to trust me. And with his mind and his hands, he'll begin to work in the creation. And one day when I come back, I will make a new heaven and a new earth so that all things, even as in the creation, bring me honor and glory. And the wonderful thing about it is we need to catch a glimpse of what God is doing in biblical history because you're a part of it. You're a part of it. God called me. 
He's called you. Why? Not because I'm good. Not because I'm religious, but, but by his grace and his mercy. And he's called you to be part of something that is big, really big. He wants you to be a part of God's family so that when he establishes the new heaven and new earth, you can rule with Christ for all eternity, not for one or two years, for all eternity, live with Jesus and rule over the new heavens and new earth. And that's why Isaiah chapter 35 ends with verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and they will come to Zion with singing. And everlasting joy will be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Isaiah was giving 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah was giving the people of God a vision of what God wanted to do. All of our lives, all we've wanted is to be happy. Right? Whether you're 12 years old, whether you're 18 years old, whether you're 40 years old, or whether you're 70 years old, all of our lives, we just want to be happy. We want to be content. We want to sense that our lives have meaning and purpose. And for some reason, we don't know why, we always feel discontent. We're never happy. Something always comes along to ruin it. But God is saying, trust me enough to follow me. And I will bring you home with singing. And I will give your life meaning and fulfillment in knowing me and serving me. And I will overwhelm you with joy. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. The invitation of the scriptures is to know God. And God says, the way to know me is through Jesus. And our decision is, what are we going to do with that? Isaiah is writing to the people of God 700 years before the birth of Jesus, and he's saying to them, time's come. You need to make up your mind. Who are you going to serve? And so God asks us this morning, who are you going to serve? God is saying, trust me enough to follow me, and I will give you joy. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks that you love us, and while we often rebel against you, while we often do things in our own way. You continue to pursue us because you love us. Help us to understand this morning that you love us. And for those this morning, Father, who don't know you, help them even this morning in the quietness of their heart to reach out and say, Lord, I'm a sinner but I need you. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.